And I just want to thank God for everything that he is doing in this hour, in this time of uncertainty, in this time of confusion, and just a shifting in our whole world. I'm so glad you're all tuning in. We have such an incredible guest with us today. I'm so honored to introduce to you our, the one and only Brother Lee Stone King, who operates in such an incredible apostolic prophetic realm. I'm so glad he's with us and he has time for us today to share some things with us today. Brother Stone King, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Brother Stone King, thank you for letting us steal some of your time today. We just want to really talk with you. You know, there's so much going on with our world right now. There's so much happening. There's so much going on when it comes to this COVID virus. There's so much happening with global unrest, with civil unrest. There's rioting, there's looting. It's almost as if we're in the book of Revelation. It's almost as if we're seeing a front runner of things to come. And at times like this, Brother Stone King, we need a word. We need a word from God. We need to hear from elders that have walked with God for many years, that understand the times, and that could really give us something that we can use right now as comfort, <laughs> stability. And we have our word, but it's, it'd be so great to have a rhema word today, Brother Stone King. What, what's going on over there in New York? How are you guys holding up to this COVID virus and all the things that's happening? I live in Saratoga County. Within my county alone, there are over 155 cases of the coronavirus. So the quarantine is very strict here. Actually, we're in a war. We are in a war, and we need to face it. There is destruction everywhere. And the enemy is unseen, but it would appear the enemy is China, who invented all of this. So we're trying to cope with it, and we're trying to rise above it. I personally am praying that the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth will knock this COVID virus out and knock out the perpetrators of it and the inventors of it, because we need to be absolutely free to worship an assembly as we've always done in assemblies and oh. to assemble because we need the laying on of hands. We need the personal contact. So I'm trusting that God will reverse everything so that the apostolic church can have the revival it needs to have and can operate in the realms that it knows to operate in. Because the gift of faith on the laying on of hands is really where it is in this hour. We desperately need that. And God is wow. going to make a way for us. There's no doubt about it. Oh, Brother Stone King, what a word. We need to hear things like that. You know, we're six months into the year. COVID virus has completely arrested the entire world. We are now, we've, we've lost people even in the body of Christ to this virus. So we have to recognize it as a real thing. I know we had some that were very skeptical, very critical, but this is truly a pandemic. Well, I remember as a child, I was, I went through the first years of uh, the last years, actually, of World War II. I was a child. We lived in uh, um, a farm community area in Iowa. We had our own cow. We had our own chickens. We had a big garden. My mother canned four to 500 quarts of fruit and vegetables every year. She baked homemade bread. We had food, but there were things we couldn't do and places we couldn't go. We survived that. Then there was the polio epidemic. And my sister and I couldn't play down by the well where we watered the cattle. We couldn't do this. We couldn't do that. We couldn't do something. We got through that. And then there was the Ebola, and then there was the SARS virus. We got through all of that. But now we're dealing with this COVID-19. This is a killer. It's nothing to play with. It's absolutely a killer. And so we've got to have, we've got to, we've absolutely got to rise up in prayer. Jesus is the answer to everything in the world. There's no doubt about it. Jesus is the answer to all of the situation's problems. So our people need to cry out to God in this hour mm -hmm. and cover themselves every day. I do this every day, Jesus. Art. Every day when I wake mm -hmm. up, I say, I cover myself with the name of Jesus. I cover myself Jesus. with the blood of Jesus. It's the last thing I say at night before I fall asleep. 
We need to cover ourselves with the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. We need to be protected. And I feel like the angels of the Lord are nearer to us now than they've ever been. The wow. angel of the Lord encampeth round about those that fear him. For example, there's an angel on my property here. I can feel him. And so I know that I'm covered. But we need to avail ourselves as apostolic people to the realm of the spirit so that we are totally protected. The church will survive. The church will not perish. We're at the latter end. We're in the end of this age, and revival is everywhere. In other words, the latter rain is seven times greater than the early or the former rain. That means that everything you read about in the book of Acts will be reenacted just before the coming of the Lord, but it will be seven times greater than anything you read about in the book of Acts. People we caught away like <sighs> Philip of old. That's already happened to C.P. Thomas in India. Miracles have happened. Billy Cole prayed 178,000 people through the Holy Ghost in one meeting in Ethiopia. So we're seeing those things come to pass. Those mm -hmm. things alone, there's great revival among us in America. There's tremendous moves of God. There are miracles happening. God is pulling at our preachers to become involved with the gifts of the Spirit like I've never seen in the 56 years I've Praise had the Holy Ghost. God. There are preachers <laughs> among us that are experimenting. They're getting involved. You've got nothing to lose, everything to gain. Someone said to me once, I prayed for someone once in a search service, and he wasn't healed. And some man walked up to me later. He said, well, Brother Stone King, you prayed for him, he wasn't healed. Why wasn't he healed? I said, I don't know why he's not healed. I'm not God. God just said to lay hands on him and pray. So that's what I do. Our now. problem is... Our problem is we major on the minuses. We need to major on the pluses. Forget what didn't happen. Let's shout and dance over what God did do. They're not healed tonight. We'll lay hands on them again tomorrow night. We'll pray for them again. That's how we have this thing. Be positive about everything. There's so much to shout and worship God about. We have freedom at this point. We have clothes to wear. We have food to eat. We have shelter. We have everything. God has taken care of us as a people. He has all, The church has always survived. It will not perish. And nothing's going to crush it at the end. Nothing will crush Israel now. Israel is home to stay. That thing is settled. Israel is not going away. They are there until the very end of the age. We are living in prophecy every day. It's coming to pass every day. You can re listen to the news, watch the news. It's like looking at things. This whole thing with COVID-19, it's like a preview of what it's going to be like once the church is raptured out of the world, how fast the world will come, just follow that Antichrist. The man who steps on the scene and he has answers for the situation, the whole world will gravitate to him, just wow. like overnight. COVID-19 unified the entire world in less than two days. The entire world came together. They weren't talking about being a Democrat or Republican. They're saying, how do we stay alive? What do we do? How do we beat this thing? That's what's happening. Everything is changing. And so we need to take advantage of that. I mean, no one's my enemy. We need to forget all the race nonsense. I mean, we need to forget the Come black, white, now. all that business. Oh, I mean, here, amen. here's the thing. Amen. I don't care what color your skin is, red, green, purple, white, black, yellow, whatever. If you go inside, our, the heart is the same color. Come on now. Come on That's now. what it's all about right there. We need to forget all this nonsense. I don't even think about those things. I mean, I, I never have thought about those things. But there were inventors of those things that pushed that stuff in upon us in the last uh, former administration. And there's a voice now pushing these things among us to keep us distracted from what God is really wanting to do. So I cover all that oh. stuff with the blood of Jesus. I pray against it, ask God to wipe it out. And I keep right on, as they say, trucking for Jesus. I just keep doing what I'm doing. The thing to do is keep a high profile and keep right on walking with God and doing what you know to do. Oh, my, my, the thing my, that, my, my, The thing that changed my life about several years ago, I was in a meeting after I'd been raised from the dead, and I had prayed all day long one day. I, I prayed all day into the night. And finally, I said, Jesus, I don't know what else to say. I told you everything I can think of. I repented of everything I can think of. I have prayed for everyone I can think of. I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to say. And I became quiet. In the, in the quietness of my home, I had the lights off. I was in the dark downstairs in my family room near the fireplace. Right, out, of right. that si out of that silence, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. This is what he said. Do you have any idea 
how many people you've tried to take to heaven in 32 years who had no intention of going. Wow. Something happened to me. I still don't understand Jeez. it. Something hit me. I threw my hands in the air and I yelled in my own home. No, I'm not going to do that. I was just the top of my voice. No, I'm finished with that. At that point, something happened to me. And I still don't understand it totally. But I, this is what I said. I am done with losers. Wow. I'm no wonder going to work with losers. We don't have time to work with losers. We've got oh. to find winners and work with winners. There are people that were promised you the world, and they're not going to ever do it. They're never going to do it. They take all of your time. 20% of your people get 80% of your time. The other people don't get any percent of your time. So here's what I've determined. Once I determine someone's a loser, I hit the eject button. I'm gone. They may make it, but they're going to make it without my help. I'm going to find winners and work with winners. Wow. And this world is full of winners if we could find them. But we don't have time to reach for them. We're just grinding around in the ruts of nonsense of people's problems. Some people... Their problems are their claim to fame. If they don't have a problem, they're going to make a problem, create one so they can get your attention. We've got beyond that. I figured out something. I watched this. I passed it three times. Art Wilson, the people in my services, in my congregations I've had who were soul winners who taught Bible studies needed little or no counseling. There's a reason for that. So winning. Wow. So Come winning on now. Come on. God. So winners, that is so, that's the heartbeat of God. It, that's God's business. So what I'm saying is, if you take care of God's business, which is soul winning, he will take mm -hmm. care of your business. That's how it works. Soul winning is God's business. Is that what you said? That's it. <laughs> oh my. It's the heartbeat of God. So when anyone who's so what I've never known anyone that was a soul winner, God just takes care of them because they're taking care of his business. He's not coming back again. Angels can't preach it. It's up to us. Hmm. If every believer became a real Bible believer, like in the book of Acts, we could take our cities. We could oh. take our cities. And what's happened? One thing hmm. COVID-19 has done, it's got the church out of the building. It's in the streets. It's in the streets, yeah. That's where it was in the beginning. That's what's going to go in the, in the hmm. end, because you're never going to build a building big enough to house what's coming. You're not going to be able to do it. And, and church history tells us that in Jerusalem, they had 30, over 60,000, no, no, they had, they had over 50,000 yeah, believers 50, in believers, Jerusalem, yeah. over mm -hmm. 50,000. And then Antioch, they had over 50,000 believers. Right, right. Well, there's no, there was no Roman Colosseum. There's nothing that could handle 50,000 people. That's, it's, going to, it's going to happen in the end. It's going to happen in the, in, in the end because... People who came to those crowds of Christians worshiping in the street, they came to mock and scoff, but they got close to the presence, the power of God, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they got the Holy Ghost on the streets. The miracles were happening on the streets. 50,000 mm. believers in Jerusalem, 50,000 in, in Antioch. It's amazing. Wow. You know, it's interesting what you said, because we did a video a few months ago, and we were just talking. We were trying to get help people with this, this, this current state of our world. And that video, and I haven't checked it as of today, but that video is exceeded 60,000 views. That's a football stadium, at least a basketball stadium of people that have was reached because we're utilizing technology in this hour to do things that we weren't really putting that kind of premium focus on. It's, awesome. That's how many people were reached by that word you gave us, 60 plus thousand. And it's still being shared, Brother Stone Kid. Awesome. It is still being shared. So what you're saying is absolutely right. We're in a time and a day that we've never seen before, but we need to be expecting these things because you said we're at the end. We're putting seen things we've never seen end. before. We've got nothing to lose, mm -hmm. everything to gain. So just try it. If some people, there are some people all right, I've had people come to me up in at the end of altar service and say, oh, Brother Stonky, that was wonderful tonight, whatever. It's a, I just felt like jumping out of my seat and running around the building. I said, well, why didn't you jump out of your seat and run around the building? <laughs> <laughs> come on now. That's what God is looking for, someone mm -hmm. that will be obedient to his gentle touch. I've had people say, I felt like climbing up on the back of the pew and just shouting. I said, why didn't you do it? One of the most incredible things I've ever seen in the years I've pastored or evangelized and pastored, 
was I was down in Connecticut years and years ago preaching a revival. There was this one couple that were in the audience. They were very mm -hmm. affluent. They had money. They were very um, polished people. Right, and, right. And uh, they were just that kind of people. And she always carried a, a lace handkerchief, and she kept it up. You always, she kept it up over this one finger and kept it right here near her cheek, just in case the tear came down. That's how they were. It was amazing. That's just how they were. And, and they, they, but they never really worshipped, never really got involved. Just that's there. interesting. <laughs> but one, but one night while I was preaching, I noticed he wasn't paying attention, was which wasn't something new. But what I didn't know was going on was he kept he he's right on the aisle seat. He kept feeling he should stick his left foot in the aisle. And he couldn't get rid of it because, see, to an intellectual mind like that, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to him. But he kept feeling he should stick his foot in the aisle. And he, and he wasn't paying attention to me, but he was preoccupied with this, sticking his foot in the aisle. All of a sudden, he, 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 sho he shoved his foot in the aisle. When he did, the power of God hit him. He jumped out of the seat into the aisle, looked like an orangutan, literally, and began to run around the building. When he <laughs> did, his, his wife nearly fainted dead away on, this, on the pew. It was unbelievable. Praise he ran. God. He made two laps around there and fell on his face in front of the pulpit. When he did that, the Holy Ghost exploded in that meeting. And when it did, people were in under the pews on their faces. Revival broke out. We had nearly 100 received the Holy Ghost over the news spread. People were baptized in Jesus' name. God is looking for someone to just be obedient to his voice. If you mm. feel like doing something in a service, you should do it. Wow. How powerful is that? And wow. There are many examples like that I can tell, but I saw that. It, nothing was happening. Nothing was happening in that meeting. And I was frustrated. I preached there a couple of weeks. Nothing had happened. So on that Sunday night, I said to myself, I got in the pulpit. This is how I started. I said, well, ladies and gentlemen, I said, I'm going to have a big time here tonight, whether you do at it. <laughs> and that's what happened. Come on now. Really what's happening, folks, you guys getting an opportunity to sit in on when me and Brother Stone King have devotions like this on a weekly basis, he keeps, he keeps me saved and going. And he speaks into my life and speaks into my spirit words like this so that, so that we can operate at the level that we need to operate in. And, and you, you, sometimes that, that awakening doesn't come to you if you don't understand what time it is, if you don't understand what's at stake, and if you don't understand what is available to us and since we're kind of talking about devotions, Brother Stone King, we need a word. Um, I know we were we were talking about some things recently, and it was so powerful. Some things that God has shown you. I know it will be a <laughs> blessing to the body of Christ if you share with us some of those things that we were talking about that God has been showing you in the spirit. I'd be happy to do so. I think this, what I'm about to say here, will help give people understanding. We need understanding. We, we need to know what's going on and what is happening in our day. There is something in the Bible called the backbone of prophecy. It's called Daniel 70 weeks. It is the backbone of Bible prophecy. So as a little foundation for that, uh, the people of Israel, uh, they, were, they had, they had uh, Samuel. He was a circuit-riding judge, is what he was, powerful, like an evangelistic judge. But the people looked around, and they saw other nations around them had kings. So they said to Samuel, we want a king. Please give us a king. And Samuel tried to stop it. He said, if, you, if, if I give you a king, he'll take your sons to war. He'll tax you. And he told them all the things that would happen to them if they had a king. But they, didn't, they wouldn't listen. They insisted on having a king. So he gave them a king. Saul was the first king of Israel. He, he right. ruled for 40 years over all 12 tribes of Israel. David succeeded him. He ruled over all 12 tribes for 40 years. Solomon succeeded his father David. He ruled over all 12 tribes for 40 years. But Solomon 
in his reign fell into idolatry. He had married all these heathen wives, and he went to the groves or the mountains round about Jerusalem, where they had built like their totem poles, their worships of, of these various statues. He went in and worshiped with them. As a result of that, judgment fell, and God divided the kingdom of Israel. That's why in the Old Testament, you read about Israel for a long time. Then you read about Israel and Judah. Well, Israel and Judah is after Solomon had failed God and God had judged. So the northern kingdom be called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom right. lasted till about 721 BC. They would not do what is right. God sent plagues of lions among them, all kinds of things. They would not do what's right. So the Assyrians conquered them. So now we've got the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted till about 606. And God was going to judge them. He sent a warning. He gave them 18 years to repent. They still wouldn't repent. So in 588 BC, Babylon came across and conquered Jerusalem. That's what happened. In that conquering, they took what is called the good figs out of the land of Judah. And uh, there was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel was in that group. That's how Daniel got into Babylon. He was carried there. Right. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He dreamed that he saw a great image. And this image had a head of gold. It had shoulders of silver. It had a torso of brass. It had legs of iron, and its feet were iron and clay. It troubled the king. It troubled Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar called his soothsayers, his astrologers, his magicians, and told them the dream and asked them for an interpretation. But they could not interpret it, so he killed them. But news reached Nebuchadnezzar that there was a Hebrew in captivity there whose name was Daniel. And Daniel had the gift of interpretation of dreams. So Nebuchadnezzar called for Daniel. And Daniel began to explain to him <coughs> the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had. <coughs> What's interesting about it Nowhere in the Bible did God ever recognize a Gentile empire. The only way you read about Gentile empires in the Old Testament is if they got entangled with the Jews. Then, of course, they were mentioned by the Word of God and God himself in the writings of the prophets. Right. <clears throat> but Babylon was the first Gentile empire that God ever recognized. So that was the beginning of what is called theologically times of the Gentiles. Oh, okay. That began times of the Gentile. It's the first Gentile empire that God ever recognized. And that ends with the battle of Armageddon. That will, that will be the end of the times of the Gentiles. But before we get to that point, <clears throat> It's interesting that what God did, this image, tall and stately, it had a head of gold. It had shoulders of silver, arms of silver. The torso was brass. The legs were iron, and the feet were iron and clay. What God did was God used metals, precious metals and metals, to depict or explain the political glory and power of those Gentile empires. Babylon was gold. And when Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, it exalted Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar was thrilled because the, the controversy was over. The mystery was over. He could see he knew and it, it was it's just amazing the entire story but the head represented babylon which nebuchadnezzar was as daniel told him 
That was the glory. That was the political glory and power of the Babylonian Empire. That empire lasted something like about 70 years in total. It was succeeded and conquered by Media Persia. That empire lasted 200 years. But that empire was not as glorious politically as was the Babylonian. So God used silver to represent the political power of that particular empire. The Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, which lasted 170 years, the Grecian power was represented by the metal of brass. It was not as glorious or as precious as was the silver. The Roman Empire conquered the Grecian Empire. And that empire is, is to last about 2,160 years. It was represented by iron. The Roman Empire was represented by iron. But when you get to the feet, the feet was mixed with clay and iron. Here's what I'm saying. Notice, it went from gold to silver to brass to iron, from iron to iron and clay. The glory of the political glory and power of those empires deteriorated from Babylon, from gold to silver, from silver to brass, from brass to iron, from iron to iron and clay. This is what I'm saying. We have lost the glory of the gold. We have lost the glory of the silver. We have lost the glory of the brass. We've lost the glory of the iron. We're living in the mud. That's wow. why we are suffering with all the things around us. I reiterate, I repeat myself, we've lost the political power and glory of the gold. We've lost the power of the silver, the glory. We've lost the glory and the power of the brass. We've lost even the glory of the iron. We're living in the mud. Everything is muddy. Politics are muddy. Morals are muddy. People are muddy. Who can you trust? We're living in the mud. That's why you feel these things around you. You can feel pressures during the course of a day. You feel something wash over and you think it's you. It's not you. Don't fall into that trap. It's not you. It's what's going on around you. That's why some people are just feeling pressure. They feel a, a, an upheaval spiritually. They're not sure what's going on. It has nothing to do with you. We're living at the end of the age. That's where we are. We're at the end of this image. We're not, we've lost the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron. We're living, I reiterate, in the mud. But out of this period, the Bible says there will be a stone cut out without hands. And that stone is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that stone will be hurled at that image. And that stone will hit the feet of that image. And when the stone hits the feet of that image, that image will crumble. It will fall to pieces. Wow. It just will be incredible. crushed. And when that happens, that is the end of the times of the Gentiles. So, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, those who are viewing or watching or hearing, we're living at the end. Don't be trapped. Don't be deceived by the devil. If the devil can ever get your mind, he's got you. Don't let those thoughts of negativism stay in your mind. Rebuke them in Jesus' name. Get rid of those thoughts because they're not, it's not you. It's coming from the outside trying to get in you. If it gets into your mind, these negativisms, it will get into your heart. When it gets into your heart, it will help, it will help to destroy you. There's no doubt about it. So, but, so it's the most exciting hour we've ever lived in. Art is the most exciting hour we've ever lived in. It's also the most treacherous because we're dealing wow. with all the things, war everywhere, treachery everywhere. But in the middle of all of this, there is a sovereignty upon the kingdom of God. We're headed, we're involved in the greatest miracles we've ever seen. People, there are blind eyes being opened. People are being raised from the dead. There, there are legs are beginning to grow. It's amazing. 
the things that God is, cancers are disappearing out of people's bodies because we're at the end. The book of Acts is being re repeated. It's being reinvented, as it were. We're, we're. we're going to see continuously the greatest things that men and women have ever seen just before the coming of the Lord. So it's the most exciting hour. But again, I reiterate, it's the most treacherous because you have to be careful who you trust. The Bible says, try the Spirit and see if they be of God or not. You have to know what you're doing. We need the gifts of the Spirit in operation. We need the demonstration of the Spirit of God in power. If you're a pastor and you're listening to me, if the power of God falls in a song service, scrap your notes. The choir doesn't have to sing. Climb, oh, leave that pulpit. Glory. Climb over the pews. Glory, lay hands glory, on people. Glory. Once you do that, that is a signal to the audience that they can do the same. And when you do that, the gift of faith will take over. The gift of faith will do more in seconds than we'll ever do. We could, it would take days, months to do some of the things. The Holy Ghost... One simple move of the Holy Ghost, one touch of God can eradicate everything. He can do more in seconds than we could do in weeks of counseling and teaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need a sovereign move of God. That's what we need. And that's what I'm praying for. Oh, you know, Brother Stone King, what you have just shared with us is an absolute revelation. I just, I just sat and took it all in. The way you put that together and what God has been showing you, it's literally as if the alarm clock is going off right now. And if we're Amen. not careful, you mentioned it earlier, if we're not careful, we'll get distracted with all of this other stuff. And the book of Acts is supposed to be happening right now in the church. Amen. It's just absolutely powerful. We've got a lot of distractions going on. I want you to pray for us as well, because I know we're running low on time, but I want you to pray for us because there is, a, there is in, in the midst of all the potential of the church, people are getting distracted with social media. They're having, and I'm talking about the church, they're having absolute racial wars of disagreements on social media. There's people condemning folks for for believing COVID is real. There's people condemning folks for believing COVID is not real. It's almost as if there's a spirit of division running loose in our world. And it's using all of these distractions and all of these tragedies to really draw the attention of the church away from what you're telling us, that there is an alarm clock going off. It is like... We're trying to be pulled away into a spirit of division. It's absolutely correct. I don't, I don't flow with any of the trends. I live for God, do what I know to do as an apostolic, and I'm trying to reach everyone that I possibly can because if we can keep our balance, the whole Bible is about balance. The whole Bible. There are people so far right they can't get their, cor their either head out of a corner. There are people so far left. Baptists are better apostolics than they are. We need a balance in all of this thing. We need to stay in the middle and have balance. The whole Bible is about balance. And we need to lift up the power and the Word of God and what is taught in the Bible. There is only one message, Art. It's Acts 2.38. There is no other message. For example, everything from Genesis to the book of Acts says something's coming. For example, mm -hmm. the Old Testament, the Jewish people were all in, they're still involved with this. The Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. That was the hope, that was the hope, that was the chant, that was the dance, that was the rejoicing signal. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah came, but that wasn't it. The Messiah said the comforter's coming. Wow. In other words, Jesus said, I'm not it. The Comforter's coming. The Comforter came in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, verses 2, 1 through 4, as you know. So everything after the book of Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all the way through the book of Revelation, it's obvious something has happened. So I'll repeat. Everything... From Genesis to the book of Acts, something's coming. Everything after the book of Acts says something has come. Yes. So without the book of Acts, 
the Bible is totally an empty hall. Wow. It's an empty hall. It all culminates in an upper room in old Jerusalem in 33 AD with the sound of a rushing mighty wind and the crackle of cloven tongues of fire. And 120 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they shook their world and they destroyed the Roman Empire. It crumbled because the lions couldn't eat it. The fire couldn't burn it and the walls couldn't hold it. There was nothing, nothing that could stop it. And I am praying that that same intensity reaches the world again, because there is no ism or schism out there that is greater than the Holy Ghost inside of us and the baptism of Jesus' name upon our very souls and tissues and fiber. There's nothing greater than what you and I've got a hold of, but we've got to stand up and preach it. It doesn't make any difference if they want to hear it or not. I begin to tell things I've never told before. I told a crowd just recently, I said, I've never told these things before because I wasn't sure you believe it. I said, I don't care if you believe it or not. You need to hear it. <laughs> Come on and, now. And that's how it is. Because <laughs> this, all, this, gospel, this gospel only works on the hungry and the thirsty. It was never designed for the scoffers or the mockers. So ignore them. Forget those people. Reach for those that are hungry. Reach for the, those people that are hungry. Reach, reach for winners. And you'll have a powerful church. You're always going to. Here's something else that's very interesting. I don't care if you've got a church of 10 or 10,000, you've got the inner circle and you've got the outer circle. Jesus had 12 disciples. One was a total traitor. So we've got, we've got 11 left. Three of them, only three were on the inner circle Peter, James, and John. Three were on the, were on the inner circle or in the inner circle Peter, James, and John. Right. You don't hear a great deal about any of the other eight in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's all about Peter, James, and John. They were the inner circle. Well, in your church, I don't care if it's small or large, you've got an inner circle or an outer circle. It's that inner circle that makes your church go. It's that inner circle that pulls the preach out of you when you're in the pulpit. It's that inner circle you draw your strength from. It's not the periphery. It's the inner circle. Every church has got an inner circle, and that's the circle you need to work with. Don't ignore the others, but don't waste your time with a lot of the others because you need to work with the inner circle. Out of the inner circle will come preachers and pastors and evangelists and missionaries and demonstrators of the Spirit of God and power in your services. Praise God. What a word. That's a word for all of us pastors. That is a word from God right there for all of us pastors. In this spirit of division, in this, this spirit of chaos, even in the church, there's people criticizing the decisions of the pastor because these things have never happened before. We're trying to do our best to pray and find the mind of God. And I'm not going to criticize a pastor for the decision they've made to open, not to open, because I don't know what God is telling them for that area. But the people there could come against you and fight you. And I think Brother Stone King has given us a word right now to us pastors. Just We're just flowing with the Holy Ghost. I think we've got a word from God. We've got to, we've got to focus on this word and let this word give us direction. Amen. It's it's powerful. Brother Stone King, I think I think we're coming to a good place where we can pray and you can um just pray over us. I think if I was to put this correctly, if you could pray over the world. And I know that's a <laughs> I know that's a large, large task, but um I just feel that. God has put you in a position where you could speak some things to the church and the world in the midst of all of this, where we can get on track, we can move forward, and we can find the heartbeat of God. Is that all right? Yes. And one last thing. Don't waste a lot of time defending the gospel. The gospel defends itself. Just preach it. Wow. Wow. Just preach it. Just preach it. It works on the hungry and the thirsty. The others will drop off. Don't worry about that. God knows what he's doing. God okay. knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, well, let's pray together here, okay? For, we'll pray for the, for the world, for the, everyone 
of the word of God by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we've exalted you today, your word, the depths of your word, the power of your word. I pray, God, that you'll wrap your arms of love around every mind, every emotion, every soul that is listening or watched or will hear these words that we have spoken today. I'm asking, God, that you will put a hedge around our people that no human spirit can penetrate, that no force of darkness darkness can penetrate. I'm praying an anointing upon every preacher, every missionary in the world. Help them to preach with the greatest authority they've ever preached with, to absolutely be on fire with the presence and power of God. Let them have a holy boldness come upon them that nothing will distract them in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you will, by the authority of the word, by the power, the name of Jesus. Glory and name of Jesus. God, you said your word would not go forth and return to you void. I pray, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, that a great excitement. I'm asking also, God, for our preachers. Lord Jesus, you know we have the greatest preachers in apostolic Christianity of any preachers in the world. I pray for everyone that everyone, whether they hear my voice today or not, that you'll replace the virtue that's gone out of them, that you'll replace, oh Lord, the energy that they've given. Give them strength. Heal their families, their spouses, their children. God, I pray, put a protective hedge around our people. We need the protective power of God in this hour. I pray for the ministry of angels among us. Angels are ministering spirits to the would-be heirs of salvation. I pray for it, God, today in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by whatever authority, I action power of God that's inside of me. I pray, God, that the name of Jesus, the Bahato Kesho Toro Vareko Shataya, I pray, oh God, the name of Thank Jesus you. upon everyone oh. involved with the session today. I pray the blood of Jesus upon everyone within and involved with this session today. We will give you praise, glory, and honor. We give you thanks. We give Jesus. you praise, O oh Master of the universe. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Wherever you're at, let's just worship the Lord for a moment. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for the anointing. We receive that prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the ministry and the life of Brother Stone King. Thank you, Lord, for what we just received today. In the matchless name of Jesus. In the matchless name of Jesus. And we pray for Brother Stone King's strength so he can keep pouring into the body of Christ right now. I receive the word, Jesus. I receive it. Amen to new life and strength oh, to, to, to Brother Stone, Stone King right now. Praise God in the matchless name of Jesus. Woo! What an anointing. Thank you, Jesus. What an anointing, Brother Stone King. I'm so thankful for you, your ministry, so thankful that you never hesitate, never hesitate to encourage and pour into the body of Christ. And I feel the presence of God, and I feel him moving, and I feel... Like we need to go have revival. God Thank bless you, everybody Jesus. for tuning in. Brother Stone King, anything else? That's it. God bless you all. Looking forward to hearing some more from Brother Stone King soon. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. <laughs>